Would you, would you pray with me, please? Most holy and loving God, we thank you for this space. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for your spirit, and we ask that it anoint Brandon this evening as he speaks, as he brings us a word in due season here in this place in Brighton. We ask, Holy One, that you open our hearts and our minds to the message that he brings, and that you be a part of that, that you touch us, and that, Holy One, it may be your word that moves within us and seeks us out. Bless us, we pray in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. So it's always, oh, I'm, I'm Michael, I'm the pastor for the Village MCC. Uh, we meet here on a, on a Sunday at 6. And, and it's always a pleasure to meet uh, people who challenge me spiritually. And uh, I fell in love with Phyllis Tickle some time ago and, and loved the, the work that, that she does. I fell in love with Richard Raw and love the work that he does. And it's, it's especially easy to admire them because they're older than me, so they should have more experience and they should have a greater depth of spiritual understanding. And then I've read some of Brandon's work and met Brandon, who is not older than me. <laughs> Having said which, though, he has an extraordinary depth of spirituality, um, an amazing grounding, and we spent most of last night uh, bantering um, and sharing sharing our stories and uh, don't let his limited years fool you for one moment um, he has a wisdom that goes far beyond his years and it's my great privilege to welcome him here this evening to to speak so Brandon a very warm welcome <laughs> thank you so much I don't deserve most of that but I appreciate it and it's so good to come to Brighton on the middle of this tour across the UK. I mean, get to have a little vacation in the middle of it all. So it's been beautiful to be here today. And yeah, I'm here on this tour because I'm talking about this new book that's just come out um, called Nomad of Spirituality for Traveling Light. And this book has been a journey in and of itself. Um, the talk won't talk much about it, so I'll just give you a brief synopsis that it was a book that I started writing while I was a student at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago which is a very conservative fundamentalist school. And uh, when I turned it into my publisher a year later to be published, um, I was informed that the contract had to be canceled because of my support for marriage equality. Not even that I identified as LGBT, but because I supported the rights of the LGBT community to be married. Um, and they canceled my contract and told me I had been banned from the book buying industry in the United States, um, the Christian book buying industry. And that led me on a new journey with this book, and it's now um, been picked up by a great publisher here, Dr. Longman Todd, who's been brave enough to pick it up and share a story that's not all that scary, and it's actually the book in its original form had nothing to do, literally two sentences that had the word LGBT in it, nothing to do with sexuality. Um, now it's got a little bit more, but um, <laughs> that's how things go. So, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the book. I might amend this as I go, and I'd love to also just have a conversation with all of you afterwards. Uh, so thank you for coming. And to start off, when you think about spirituality, what do you think of? For many of us, especially here, you can look outside and see it, uh, we can think of oceans and the vast expanse of the sky. Or for some of us, we might think of big cathedrals, medieval cathedrals with flying buttresses and stained glass. For me, as you can probably tell from the book cover, when I think of spirituality, I think the image of a desert is a really compelling image. I think about walking, moving step by step through the valleys and deserts and roads, down pathways. I think of the aches and the pains that inevitably come as we walk on this journey, the thoughts that would come to my head as I was walking, one more mile to go, I don't know if I can make it, I'm so tired, I think I'm gonna die, how many of us have had those kind of thoughts in the spiritual journey and in the journey of life? I think of the sweat pouring down my face, which turns deep, bright red, and everything within me wants to give up. But I keep pressing forward. I know it, I'll eventually hit that point where I'll get that second wind, the moment where the pain fades and adrenaline pumps through my veins, the moment when I switch from thinking about my miserable plight and become aware of the beauty that's around me. It's these moments that I feel keenly aware of the presence of something much bigger than myself. 
my soul seems to leap within me as I find the new strength to press forward in my journey. That's what I think of when I think about spirituality. And this metaphor isn't unique to me. It's from the Jewish and Christian tradition. Wandering and walking and running are constant metaphors. And there's a story in the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, that I think has summed up and encapsulates this journey for me. It's actually, there's a chapter in the book called Journey, which is based on this scripture. In the book of Genesis chapter 12, we're introduced to a man named Abram. And we're not told anything about who this guy is, and I imagine him walking around in the middle of the desert. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, we're told that Abram hears a voice from God. And the voice tells him, Abram, take everything you have, everything you've inherited, and leave. Start walking. And go to a land that I will show you. Not a land that I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to give you instructions on where you're going. I'm not going to tell you why you're going there. Just get up, leave everything behind, and start walking. And if you do, you'll be blessed, and you'll be made a blessing to many. And if that was my situation, I think I'd have some questions for God, or whatever this voice is. I'd probably consider that I might be dehydrated and probably need to go in and lay down for a while because I'm hearing voices. I'd maybe want to pray about it or ask some more questions about where exactly I'm going and why I'm going. The stunning thing about Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 4 is that Abraham doesn't do any of that. We have the call in verses 1 through 3, the voice of God speaking, and in verse 4 it says, Thus... Abram departed. And those are three of the most profound words in all of the Bible. Because in that moment, Abram goes from being Abram, this wanderer in the desert, to Abraham, the great patriarch of the world's three great religions. He becomes this image of faith for the whole of humanity for the rest of history. Because in this moment, Abraham says that he's no longer worried about the boundaries and borders. He's not attached to his traditions, to the things that weigh him down. He's willing to step beyond, to take the first step into the unknown land, trusting only that the wind of God's Spirit will blow in his sails and guide him as he goes. And that is an image of faith. Those four verses have been some of the most impactful on my journey. I first read them when I was 12 years old, and I've memorized them and recounted them as I've gone through life. And now I'm going to skip down here. Uh, how often have so many of us had similar promptings to Abraham? I don't think Abraham's experience, by the way, is anything uh, unique. I don't think he heard the voice of Morgan Freeman coming from the sky. <laughs> I think he had a subtle internal prompting in intuition, like all of us do. All of us have had these promptings. Most of us have been overwhelmed by the proposition of what we heard inside and doubted our ability to bring it to pass. How many of us have had moments of great inspiration that we gave up only a few moments later because fear and doubt and uncertainty convinced us that we didn't have it within us to accomplish what we heard? How many of us have failed to believe that our path would be guided by that voice that prompted us? How many dreams have died this way? How many world changers have gone unrealized? How many impossibilities remain impossible because we have failed to respond to the voice within us, calling us to defy all odds, and to take a leap. This is what I believe separates the ordinary from the extraordinary. The good life from what Jesus called the abundant life. The people who are foolish enough to trust that inner voice. They become the ones who change the world, accomplish the impossible, change their communities, their families, their lives. On scales large and small, from Martin Luther King Jr. to Mother Teresa to Pope Francis and Saint Francis, to the Wright brothers and Steve Jobs. This is what makes those people in our lives who are truly living abundant life, expanding, expending all of their energy and potential. They're giving themselves to that vision, to that calling that they have. Those are the people we admire the most. This is the experience that I think Abraham has. I think we often try to supernaturalize the biblical text, and I think these people are just normal people having the same experiences we have every day. He had a subtle internal call to take a risk, to step beyond boundaries, to set out on a journey beyond all that was familiar to him. And this is what makes him such an amazing figure. The divine voice subtly nudges him to get up and start walking. And in verse 12 we're told, so Abram went. 
This is what we call faith. This is what separates the ordinary from the extraordinary. It's our willingness to respond to the divine nudges in our life. To trust that God will guide us and empower us to take the first step out of the land of our spiritual inheritance. When I first read the story, as I said, I was 12 years old. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. I'm the son of an abusive alcoholic father and a mentally uh, distressed mother. And throughout the early years of my life, I experienced a lot of physical and verbal abuse. And so by the age of 12, I was suicidal. I woke up every day and literally I remember the first thought I ever had was, will today be the day that I end my life? And it was in that context that God prompted me, and it came through some crazy religious people who lived five trailers up from us. They were crazy because they went to church not once a week, not twice a week, but four times a week, and they were homeschooled, and they wore long dresses, and they looked Amish. <laughs> and I became best friends with their daughters, and it turns out they're fundamentalist Baptists, and my good fundamentalist Baptists, they invited me to come to church with them. So I started going to church at 12 years old, and I went to this large Baptist church that preached against the dangers of the gays and abortion and all of the scary things that the devil was up to in America at that time. And yet in that context, for the first time, I heard about a God who could love me more than my father loved me. A God who wouldn't abuse me or abandon me in the way that I'd experienced from my family. And I put my faith in that God for the first time. I remember walking down that aisle in that old Baptist church while they sang, Just As I Am. And I gave my life to Christ, as we would put it. And my life was changed, completely. For the first time in my 12-year-old soul, I had a hope and a future. I felt a calling. Within four months, I was distinctly called to be a pastor. And so at 12 years old, I started a street preaching ministry where I'd go down to Baltimore every week with a group of other 12-year-olds and we'd stand on the corner, imagine this picture in your head, with signs preaching against homosexuality uh, and sharing Bibles with people on the streets. I started self-publishing books at the age of 14 because that's what all the people on TV did. And I, I just lived into this calling. My life had this meaning. I wanted other people to know about this God that I knew. To make a long story short, I ended up going to Moody Bible Institute to get my degree to become a pastor. And it was in those four years at Moody that everything in my life changed. Um, Moody is a very conservative school, if you didn't know that. And I went in as a very conservative person. But very early on in my journey at Moody, I started poking the boxes. I started asking questions. I started interacting with people that I wasn't supposed to interact with. I started a radio show on the student radio network, and it was called The Bridge. And the point of The Bridge was to expose our campus to voices of people who we might disagree with, but we could hear it from their own mouth, instead of demonizing them from a distance. So I started inviting all these well-known heretics in the United States to come and be on our radio show. I don't know if you know names like Brian McLaren, uh, N.T. Wright, who's here in the UK, is considered a heretic. Uh, other folks, I started inviting them onto this radio show, and it grew to be quite popular. But on the day I announced that I was going to interview Brian McLaren, it was also the same day that he had married his gay son in the United States. And so as soon as I announced that we'd have Brian on the program, I got a letter or an email from the dean of students at Moody who said, Brandon, your show's canceled immediately, and we're considering throwing you out of the school. Come meet with us. <laughs> yeah. In this moment, I went into that meeting and sat with the Dean of Students and another professor who grilled me for an hour and a half about my theology. They said, what do you believe about hell? What do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about homosexuality? What do you believe about creation? Of course, nothing had changed. I'd been in Bible college all of five months. I was still a fundamentalist Christian, so I passed the test with flying colors. At the end of the Inquisition, they told me, we can't kick you out because you're clearly still orthodox. But if you ever slip up, you'll be done. But I walked out of that meeting and went back to my dorm room and collapsed onto my bed, broke down in tears. Because for all my life, I'd been aspiring to this point, to come to this school, to train to be a pastor. And I was only following God, asking questions, talking to those who disagreed. And I realized that there was something so fundamentally broken 
when your religious system didn't allow room to talk to somebody who disagreed. I was even bringing heretics on campus. They were somewhere else in the country on the phone. I was talking to them. But guilt by association kicked in, and I was now a heretic because I talked to heretics, even though my theology was as fundamentalist as ever. And this period broke me. And I really saw the damage of evangelicalism. How Jesus talked about fear being the antithesis of God, because God is love, and love casts out all fear. And I started exploring more and more. I started reading other religious texts, because I, I wasn't going to let Moody box me in. And now I was really angry at them, and a little cynical. And so I was like, OK, if I'm a heretic, I'm going to be a heretic. So I started reading the Quran and the Book of Mormon, and all these crazy books. And I kept finding God in places God wasn't supposed to be. I read the Mormon Book of Mormon, and then I went to visit the Mormons. And it turns out they're really Jesus-like people. Don't agree with a lot of what they believe, but they're really Christ-like. I would visit a mosque, and I'd find God even there, even though Muslims were supposed to be the Antichrist. I'd go to the Catholic Church, and Catholics were the worst of all. <laughs> there. I didn't see them bowing down and worshiping Mary. I saw people who loved Jesus and preached the gospel more clearly than I'd ever heard it before. And through that process, I began to question the whole of my faith. Had everything I've been told about all these people been lies? Because, again, Catholics weren't worshipping Mary, and the Muslims weren't worshipping Satan, and everything, nothing seemed to be true. And I bet many of us can relate to experiences like that. In all of that, I continued to sense that God was guiding me. That it was God that was guiding me to open up each new book, to visit each new church, to talk to each new pastor or spiritual leader. And of course, when I pushed these boundaries, Moody continued to push back. Over the course of those four years, Moody tried to kick me out six more times. Uh, never successfully. Because, again, though I was talking to people, my faith wasn't shifting that dramatically. I was just discovering God in new places. At the end of my four years, I started really wrestling with questions around my own personal sexuality. And, of course, it was a slippery slope. You start questioning your theology, and then you become gay. So that's how that works. But, uh, <laughs> I started asking some serious questions about this desire that I had in me, that I knew had always existed. I remember walking into the Baptist church when I was 14 or 15 and seeing a boy in the back pew and being attracted to him and realizing immediately that if I ever let that grow, my calling to be a pastor would be off the window. I could never be a pastor and be gay. And one of my, I was the chaplain of the men's choir at Moody, and as you would expect, boy after boy would sit down with me and tell me, Brandon, I have something I want to confess to you. I struggle with same-sex attraction. And one year on my dorm floor of 30 guys, 12 guys came out to me as LGBT. It turns out the Bible colleges are like bug zappers for gay kids. <laughs> lied to them, trying to escape. And I thought Moody would be the last place that I'd ever have to deal with this struggle that I hid for so long. Because I'd gotten here. I was in this monastic-like environment. Of course there were no gays here. And yet, I found myself best friends with LGBT people who were closeted. And of course, as a good Christian, I told some of my mentors about my struggle once it became okay to talk about. And my senior year, they advised me, because they saw this and all of my other heresy coming to fruition, they said, if you want to prove that you are actually one of us and that you're committed to us, we want you to start a year of a version of reparative therapy called Healing Prayer. And if you do that, you'll prove to us that you're actually with us, that you're not going to... Literally, the quote was that you won't leave here and rave, uh, wave rainbow flags. Well, here we are. That's <laughs> <laughs> how uh, this story goes. Uh, so I entered a year of reparative therapy with a woman who I believe was an ex-lesbian. She never actually confided that in me, but it's quite clear from our time that we spent together. I'd go in every week and confess all of my sexual longings to her, and she would pull a crucifix out and some holy water and pray over me, asking God to heal those broken desires, heal the abuse in my past that caused me to be gay. I left Moody and 
by the grace of God, somehow walked across that stage and got my degree. And when I left, I was more disillusioned with evangelicalism, more disillusioned with my faith than ever. Because my view of God had completely expanded, but my view of the church had all but died. Because it was filled with fear as a place to try to suppress, to systematize me and God and tell me that my experience of God wasn't good enough or true, or that how God made me was somehow flawed or broken. And so I left Moody, and I moved back to Washington, D.C., and I had no clue what I was going to do with my life. And the quick of the story is, I moved back to D.C., and I'd been blogging a little bit about marriage equality. And I got a phone call one day that said, hey, Brandon, my name is so-and-so, and I'm starting a new organization called Evangelicals for Marriage Equality. Would you like to come be the national spokesperson with us? Okay, so closeted gay guy, still not sure what I believe getting this phone call out of the blue to be a national spokesperson. I had no clue what that meant. For some reason, I said yes. Overnight, my sexuality and my fight for marriage equality was in Time Magazine and Wall Street Journal. And every major evangelical leader that talked about sexuality had written something in response. I was condemned on radio shows across the United States as an LGBT heretic who had come into the church to preach false teaching. And again, at this point, my theology hadn't changed very much on LGBT issues. I still thought it was sinful. I just believed that the church should support the civil right to get married of LGBT people. And yet, I continued to see this rejection and this fear being perpetuated by these people who had never met me, who only read a soundbite or heard a soundbite of what I believed or what I was articulating, and they were so afraid of me. And I realized that I had been lauded in churches for eight years growing up, as the prodigy, the guy who was going to be the next big pastor, the guy who they all believed in. But as soon as I started talking about marriage equality and LGBT issues, I, the same paths of affirmation in my church became side glares and people telling me, can we pray for you? All because I supported this group of people who I realized that the church had hurt so much. Over the next year, I continued doing this work, and I turned in my manuscript in January, and my publisher canceled my book deal. And that ended up becoming national news as well. And overnight, um, a writer from Time Magazine who I'd been working with accidentally published the article about my book contract getting lost early, and also in that article outed me as queer. And for the first time, I was publicly identified as LGBT. I had just started becoming comfortable with identifying that way. My friends, my family, my Bible college all found out on Facebook through Time Magazine that their son, their friend, their student was a queer man. And most people had no clue what that meant. So I realized here in the UK, queer is an interesting word to use. In the United States, um, it doesn't have quite as negative of a connotation. But for me, it meant that my sexuality was fluid. That I write about this in Nomad, that all of us, I believe, are intrinsically queer or fluid, which simply fights against this desire of our society to overly label us. We are all different, we're all unique, we're all made in the image and likeness of an expansive and eternal God. How could we ever expect that any two of us would be alike? No two snowflakes are alike or fingerprints are alike. No two people are alike either. And so, since I was out at Time Magazine, never thought that was going to be part of my story, um, my journey has been more expansive and more open than ever, both spiritually and with sexuality. My spiritualities continue to grow beyond the confines of the narrow evangelicalism that I once to embrace. And I've moved to this place where I describe my spirituality as one of wonder, which is what I think it's all truly about anyways. It's so easy for us who have been hurt by the conservative church to switch and be on the far left and to spend our lives fighting back against the conservative church. And in fact, we've become a fundamentalist of a different kind. Our political values are right, all our speakers are right, our churches are right, and they're wrong. But that binary and that dualism is the exact toxic thing that pushed us away to begin with. And we wonder why the conservative church only gets more radical and more conservative. It's because we're over here throwing the same stones that were thrown at us. And I understand why that happens and why that's necessary. I did it for some time. But my journey has led me to this place where 
I've really had to come to terms with the teachings of Jesus of loving our enemy, forgiving those who persecute us. And I've come to find that more of my conservative brothers and sisters have been willing to change their hearts and minds when I've been willing to be an open channel for the Spirit and to be willing to enter into relationship with them. I've never seen anybody whose mind's changed on anything spiritual or around sexuality that hasn't known an LGBT person. It's easy to demonize from a distance. It's hard to demonize somebody who's a friend. In my book, I quote an African proverb which says, when I saw him from far off, I thought he was an animal. When he got closer, I realized he was a human. And when we were face to face, I saw he was my brother. And that is the journey that changed my life. It opened my spirituality. And it's the journey that all of us are called to, especially the LGBT community, as hard of a call as that is. It's the call of Christ to take up our cross and to be willing not to go back into communities that are going to abuse us and misuse us, but to let go of our pain and our anger and to say grace to you. Blessing, not curse. Because I understand what it's like to be a non-affirming Christian or a homophobic Christian or a transphobic Christian. I still struggle with all of that. Our journey is one of coming to our true self and putting off our false self. And we all wrestle with these messages that we were taught growing up about our sexuality, our gender identity, or what we believe, or what political party we vote for. But I think the journey of spirituality needs to be one that moves beyond these certainties that both liberalism and conservatism want to give us, and instead living in this space of wonder and humility that says none of us actually know. And that's what I've learned more than anything, especially when I'm speaking. I like to emphasize, I don't know what I'm talking about. All oh, this could be wrong. Um, <laughs> We all are on this journey together, no matter how young or old, no matter what sexual orientation or gender identity, we're walking this path. And the path is to look out and to sense God all around us, to sense God in everything, in the conservative church and in those who are like us. And as we do that, meaning begins to swell up in our life. We begin going from a place of certainty and systematic theology and creeds that we confess every Sunday and ritual to a place where every moment is brimming with spiritual life and meaning. We live our lives wide-eyed and fulfilled. Fulfillment doesn't come from being at home. Fulfillment comes on the journey. Pope Francis says, life is a journey. When we stop, things don't go right. And I think that's such a true statement. It's counterintuitive to everything we're taught. We all are longing for that place that we can call home. But the call is actually to keep walking, to never be satisfied with where we're at, to know that there's more beyond our boundaries, that God is bigger than whatever we believe right now about God, that God is bigger than whatever we think people should be like, whatever we think they should believe. God is bigger than that, and all of it belongs. Every part of our life belongs. And that is the journey of the book, Nomad. The book starts with a chapter called Wander which is something I believe we're called to, and it ends with a place called wonder. And I think that's the journey that the Spirit of God is leading humanity on right now. Salvation, according to Jesus, is not about going to heaven when we die. Jesus says in John chapter 3, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Salvation is about a new way of seeing the world that we're in right now. It's a new way of being in the world that we're in right now. The whole cosmos is our destination. We are already home. The kingdom of God is at hand. Our world is being transformed and redeemed. Like Abraham, we will never know where our path is leading. And I have no clue where my journey is going to lead me. My faith, my life is constantly changing, morphing and evolving. There's always more to explore, more to be heard, more experiences to be had. Nothing will ever fall into these neat boxes and categories that we all desire. And we need to abandon our fear. So many of us still have fear. Those of us who have been hurt by the church still have a lot of fear. But fear is the opposite of love, and fear prevents us not only from giving love, but experiencing love. The one thing we can be sure of is that the God who promised that as we wander through the mountains and valleys of life, seeking and searching, exploring in authenticity, that we will be guided by him. 
guided by her, guided by it, that divine life within. As the writer of Proverbs says in what is probably my favorite verse in all of Scripture, trust in God with all of your heart and do not rely on your own perspective. In everything you do, acknowledge God and God will direct your path. Our perceptions are finite. But in the midst of it all, God promises to lead us. So that is the message I want to leave with you today. Listen to that divine voice within. Respond to it without fear or hesitation. Open your eyes, your ears, your life to the bigness of God. May we reject our desire for certainty, for rightness, and take the first step towards the land of promise that God has shown us. Because when we do, we'll be led into uncharted lands. And that's what life is about. We must keep moving. We must abandon our comfort, leave behind our fear, heed the Spirit's call, and take a leap. And if we do, we will live the extraordinary life. This I know for sure. willing, I'd love just to chill up here and talk to you. Again, I have no answers, so I just really do want to talk to you guys. <laughs> I'm very struck by what you say. <clears throat> um, I come from a Pentecostal background. I've had deliverance and exorcism. And took a whole, you know. yeah. Even now, I still struggle with this internalised homophobia. Mm. My head tells me, you know, scripture tells me it's mm. rubbish. But even now at my age, it's, this, it's still mm. something I struggle with. Right. right. And I think that's been a hard journey for me. I'll tell you where that really shows up for me. In America, I'm sure you've all been watching and hearing about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this racial justice. It's really hard for me uh, to talk about white privilege. Um, I don't like it. I hate it. I hate admitting that there's still racism in me. I don't want to say that. I thought we were done with racism after Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and that's a part of me. And having to wrestle with that and understand that, I think that's the only thing we can do. I don't think you'll ever be able to rid yourself of homophobia, sorry to say. Mm -hmm. Neither will I. I all the phobias, uh, racism and prejudice, still exist within me, but the journey that we're called to is to keep wrestling with them and to find it, and what it's a very biblical word, to repent, to turn from it. Mm -hmm. That's all it means is to say, I look at that, I acknowledge what it is, and I say, I'm not going to allow that to have space in my life. It might still be in my mind. I'm still, like I said, I'm still racist. We all are. And yet, I choose intentionally not to be racist in my actions. And you being here is great evidence that you're not allowing that homophobia to overtake your life. Um, and I, I commend that. Thank you for being willing to do that. It's a hard journey. I'm interested what you said about the Bible Institute in yeah. there for a long yeah. time. Has there been any move since, since you've become very much a, a figure that's, that's internationally known. Has there been any move at the Bible Institute? In the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah, this has been my journey with Moody is as soon as I left, as soon as I graduated, and then I kind of publicly became known as this LGBT person, um, they began, teachers began spinning myths in classes. So I would be getting audio, I could show you audio recordings from students that were in their classes. When teachers would rant about me as that student who walked away, that false teacher who, like, as a warning to other students. And I had heard stories about the gay people that went to Moody that left and became gay, and they went into the dark pit pal and whatever else happened. And I determined, and I don't know how, and it's probably insane, and I, take, I need a lot of counseling probably, uh, but I decided that I was going to make sure that that didn't become the narrative about me. So I determined right when I graduated that I'd return at least twice a year to the campus um, and spend time with students on the campus and make sure that people knew that I was on the campus so that they could see me, they could hear from me, they could know that I wasn't 
Satan, that I was still a Christian, that I actually am doing ministry, that I still love God, want to be a pastor. And that has been the hardest thing. I was just on the campus six weeks ago, and it's major PTSD, like never more anxiety. It's terrifying to walk back on that campus. And to see my college roommate, who after he found out that he had been living with a gay boy for four years, was quite terrified and very angry. Uh, he just moved to Denver, and right after I came out, he took me out and said, I'm really disappointed in you, and I don't know if we can talk anymore. He moved to Denver because I insisted that we'd stay in a relationship, and he just about three weeks ago came over and had dinner with me and my boyfriend, and is now in this place where that empathic understanding kind of developed, and the myth didn't grasp hold. And so Moody's gone in the wrong direction politically. They've really aligned themselves with the anti-LGBT and still promote this terrible reparative therapy stuff. But there's now me and a couple of other students who have come out who are very clearly doing God's work in ministry, according to Moody's perspective. And um, I think we're challenging the narrative, which is not going to affect the administration, but the students. Mm -hmm. They just... You can't deny when you know people. Yeah. And I might be the only gay person some of those students will know for a while, and they're conservative for at least the ones that they know about. Um, but, yeah, so that's been my experience. It sounds, the seeds of hope are there, doesn't it? It sounds as if the, the first few people are beginning to thaw. Yeah, thaw I mean, out. in 2011, yeah, this is the mind-blowing poll, 47% of those who identify as born-again Christians that are millennials in America supported marriage equality, 2011. That is estimated to be as high as 60% right now. So millennial fundamentalist Christians support marriage equality. Now that's who Moody Bible Institute and all these other schools have as students. So that is the sign of hope. It's, and I, the other talk I give on this tour, I really think it's a movement of God's spirit bringing revival to the church through LGBT people. Um, and it's just unprecedented in recent history. We've not seen something. Such an ethical divide between those with power and money in the church and the young people who are the future of the church. So it's interesting. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Brendan. My name's Bill. Bill. Yes. Uh, uh, you brought tears to my eyes. They're quite emotional. But the journey of um, rejection that you have from the um, not you know, not just your family, your ch the church, etc. Because I experienced that a long time ago, and one of the things I lived in, as you described, was this state of fear for a long, long time, and I had no concept of how to get out of this state of fear, because I had to live within the certain boundaries of my family and the church, etc. I was absolutely clueless, but and I had no idea or concept that LGBT existed. It wasn't until I was able to become a young adult that I was able to discover, you know, that I've got yeah. the right to the Lord Jesus Christ as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't through the LGBT. Yeah. And I'm so I'm so glad that I found it. And one of the biggest things I also picked up was, I mean, I come from a, a very sort of, if you like, high Anglo-Catholic background. And yes, that's right, there are religions out there that believe in God, and they've got the <coughs> rights to believe in God, the same as I've got the rights to believe in God. But it was interesting what you said was, you know, accept what they say and accept what they do. They're not wrong, you know. We're all on the journey mm -hmm. to try and find the truth and, we, and everybody else has got the rights to find the truth, the same as what we have as part of the LGB community. Well, thank you so much. For thank you. Yeah, I love that. I think, yeah, I think God is working in all people at all times, in all places, in all things. Mm -hmm. And that's what living in wonder is about, right? Is yeah. the humility to say, of course Christianity doesn't have it right. Have you seen what we've done for 2,000 years? Yeah. But, uh, and neither does Islam, but we both have yeah. a path that we're on. And I, you're, thank you for your journey. Mm -hmm. I don't just say this, and I really, um, it's been far easier for me to come out in this day than 
what a lot of people in very yeah. recent history have had to go, right. go through. And so the real courage and where I learn is from the wisdom of those who have had to go through just absolute hell. Um, and so thank you for being willing yeah. to stand as a person of faith and LGBT. to know LGBT people as people mm. rather than as the demon um, is exactly right and I think uh, I think that LG people are <laughs> going to get killed now uh, I think <laughs> LG people are probably 10 years ahead of the BT people in being safe to come out and identify and be you know, within society, and I think that the BT people need to be, you know, the, the, the bravery needs to be happening so that we can then go out and go, yeah, well, we're here as well. Yeah. In ten, 10 years' time, people, more people will realise that they're living amongst LGBT people. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And I think getting to see, especially the secular LGBT community, because there's a huge Christian LGBT community, um, the polarization, how, how true it is that we, who are hurt, end up hurting yeah. other people. Uh, and I understand we're on a healing journey, and so not to beat up the LG too badly, but also needing to always be calling ourselves to, from a theological perspective, all of this is image and expansiveness of God. And so, again, of course we're like, yes, BT people exist, of course, everything's fluid, but yeah, we have a long way to go. And for those in the BT community, um, we need a lot more resources, a lot like it's, yeah. So I think right, right on to that, keep the courage up and may those of us who are in the LG piece continue to be mindful of our privilege because we do have privilege now, especially in places like here in America where we do, like the gay community is the most influential political force in American government right now. Uh, I would argue that against anybody. So maybe use that to help those beneath that are still under oppression. I like what you were saying as well about um, not picking up the stones and throwing them back. Mm. Because it's so easy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. so easy to do that. So it's really good to be, to, to hear. Yeah. Need to not do that. I'm not good at it. <laughs> it's the hardest thing. Like it's, but this is why I'm still compelled by Jesus. This is why I still like Jesus a lot, because he was on to something. Uh, love your enemies will piss everyone off. Uh, this I, this might piss people off in the room right now. Um, the Boston Marathon bombing in the United States. Yeah. The day that happened. This was not me being having valor. It was just something that happened. I posted a picture that day that said, pray for, Z pray for Zokar, who was the bomber. And it was actually kind of, I was a little cynical in doing it. Um, it wasn't all great intentions of me saying, let's pray for our enemies. But the response I got on that, hundreds of thousands of people calling for my death, and like, how could you do that? You like The way of the gospel is foolishness to the world, but to those who are being saved, it is the newness of life, it is redemption. Jesus' way is not easy, but if you want to see the conservative church come around, it's not going to happen from picketing them, from oppressing them, from in America we're having this big conversation about religious freedoms, which is not something you really have to talk about here because church and state are so intertwined, but we need to make sure the LGBT community doesn't start trying to make churches silent. They have the right to say harmful things. And if we stand with them and show them love in that and say, we defend you, which is so counterintuitive and the whole, everybody else looks at us like crazy. But that, man, what a testimony to the Spirit of God, the grace of God. And we of all people know that. I believe the coming out journey and the LGBT journey is the most spiritually maturing journey that anyone can ever go on. 
And I think the LGBT community is among the most spiritually mature people on the planet. And we have this ability now to take what we've learned through pain and suffering and come back and say, yeah, you did this to me. And as Christ does, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Thank you. And I'm convinced that's the way to heal the world. So. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, it, it's, I understand that you, you kind of have a voice in, in terms of the, um, uh, the uh, Christian, you know, the evangelical community um, as an LGBT person. How, how do you turn that around so that you can then speak to people who are um, LGBT, however, have turned their back on the church because they haven't had somebody, a mentor or experience that, that's been able to carry them through that mm -hmm. because they're kind of on the other side of the doorway mm -hmm. um, and um, and don't, don't also don't understand that there's light on this side. So how do you yeah. how do you navigate that as well? How yeah. do you? Yeah, I think being easy on the LGBT community in some sense, um, I would a lot of the stuff that I say here in a context of faith, um, I wouldn't. It's not helpful to go around and tell somebody who's just been hurt. Forgive your enemy now. Uh, mm -hmm. Not going to work. You'll become the enemy. So, um, I think, still though, I think the call for us really isn't, it's not for the church to do anything per se. The church should be working on her own theology. Uh, but for LGBT Christians and people of faith to go out and stand in the community, it's a whole other coming out experience, right? Like it's mm -hmm. shameful to a lot of the LGBT community. <coughs> But when we can demonstrate that we are actually people of faith, that there's still something vital to this, and we're no less gay, no less lesbian, no less transgender than we were before, um, what you begin to do is you begin to dispel fear. And that's the only thing we can do, is as we show people, yeah, I am that dreaded Christian, but I'm not like the one that kicked you out of your church. I'm not like the one who kicked you out of the home and made you homeless. I'm not like the one who abused you. Like, it's the same both ways. It's that need for empathic understanding. Because if you don't have that, you're stuck in either your own pain or the ideological world. And ideologies kill people. I think the Apostle Paul says, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, other human beings, but against powers, principalities, and I would add ideologies in the heavenly realms. These disembodied things. That's what kills people. Is the church has a disembodied theology. If it incarnated its theology, it'd see that we're all made in the image of God, and this wouldn't be a problem. Um, and we must not allow ourselves to do that to the LGBT community either. Because it's easy also, let me just rant on this, for the gay, com gay Christian community to look back and say, they're a bunch of heathens, the LGBT, <laughs> like believing the same things we were told about ourselves. Have you seen pride parades? Have you gone? Like, no, they're not. Um, this is what all of culture does. Even the straighties go to their clubs and dance and do all this stuff. Not allow ourselves to become that judgmental, self-righteous, hypocritical, gay Christian because, again, that's the fundamentalism of the other side. And so just remaining in community and being empathic and being like Christ, who being in the form of God became like the people he was with. Jesus is, stick to Jesus, we'll do this all day. <laughs> He's a pretty good, pretty good guy. Yeah, my good there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said that you feel called to be a pastor. Where, where is that on your radar at the moment? Where, where is that? Still you? there, yeah. You guys are convincing me, especially with all this weather, about being a pastor over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of places that could do with good church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also, that just to say this as a side, encouraging you, this tour... There's so much happening here mm -hmm. that I don't think many people realize um, among gay Christians. Um, there's so much happening. And I really think you should be incredibly hopeful about the future of this conversation in the United Kingdom. Um, and I would love to be a pastor right now. My plans, uh, I was just talking to a friend about it earlier, um, I want to plant a church probably in West Hollywood, California, which is the gay neighborhood there and Greenwich Village, New York, which is gay-ish in New York, and have like two kind of LGBT 
spiritual communities, um, whatever that looks like. So that's my dream right now. Uh, right. But it's a few years off. I'm finishing up my master's degree still. So once I get that, I'll see what happens next. But we have a, a group in Brighton that meets every month, and we, we started out about two years ago based on the works of John Shelby Spong. Sure. And um, I wondered whether, I mean, he's been terrific, you know, his work is, yeah. is, is so supportive and helpful, and, um, and we were able to Skype him as well oh, last awesome. year, which was great. Um, but I wondered, I mean, obviously, he he's perhaps been one of your. I d has he been any way a mentor for you, or is, do you have a kind of support network? Yeah. Um, I do. In the United States, there are a tremendous number of people, um, straight religious leaders, who have come forward and been very sacrificial in the past decade or two. A number of them are endorsers on the book. I really just went around to all the people who had impacted me and said, hey, can you do this for me? Um, so Brian McLaren is the most Christ-like person I've ever met. Um, and I think he's helped me through so much of this. Um, Rob Bell is another big one who's been very helpful through this. Um, even here in the United Kingdom, we have people like Vicki Beeching, who's here tonight mm -hmm. in the back. I'm not going to offer too much, but her journey has been like people like that who have had the boldness of saying, I'm going to do this. And even from a distance, whether it's an LGBT person or um, a straight person being willing to say, no more will God's kingdom be ex exclusive. Mm -hmm. Those people have shaped me in so many ways. And then the mystics. I think if we all were a little bit more mystical, there would be no problems in this world. Uh, just this non-dualistic thinking um, that has shaped me so much in the past decade now. I'm getting old. Getting old. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a bad joke. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Really rude question then. How old are oh, you? Well, yeah. <laughs> What's your guess? Um, when I first saw you uh, by the door, I was like... 12. <laughs> it's not even out of high school. <laughs> um, I would guess uh, looks like 20, if that. Close. Um, I was ID'd at one of your bars tonight. Okay. And so that was... Oh. I don't know what that means, but you're drinking age of 16? 21. Well, 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18. 18, but if you look 21 or under, you have to be ID'd. Yeah. yeah. 23 turned 24 in three weeks. Right. So, yeah, but close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been a hell of a 23 years. I was going to say, that's, that's an awful years. lot packed yeah. into those those years. Yeah. It's been a lot. Yeah. Good people to process with and a lot of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend counseling to everyone in the room. Just throw that out there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Are you working on another book? Yeah, when I get back from this, uh, in July, I'll start um, what will be what I consider, it feels like my big book. It's called Forward, How Sexual and Gender Minorities Will Save Christianity. Um, and it's a theology, it's the other talk I'm giving a lot of places while I'm here, about just basically, statistically right now, in the United States, I'll just share this part, every demographic of Christianity is declining across the board. Mm -hmm. The one demographic that is consistently increasing is LGBT people. Over 50% of LGBT people in America identify as Christian. Over 75% identify as spiritual. There is something happening there. It's also happening among women. And it's happening among people of color. People in the global south are coming to faith in a new way. And it's not the same old fundamentalistic faith. It's a new kind of spirituality. And I think God is doing something. I think there's theological basis for it from the Bible. Um, and so it's this weird call of theology, sociological uh, information, and then me just trying to also do what I kind of did here tonight a little bit, is call both the LGBT community and the church to say, let's heal ourselves and start working on each other. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. It's probably about a year and a half, two years out from that. But going to start in July, after a week break, so, yeah. Have you got a contract for that? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. It's actually, with this book, the interesting thing is, it still won't sell in the United States. Don't have a contract for it there. Lovely DLT here has been so bold to pick it up, uh, but... You haven't had the publisher in the States? It's... Goodness me. It's still 
it, even a lot of the progressive ones are afraid of, well, the controversy around it made it sound like it was this terrible, like, <laughs> satanic gay orgy book or something like that. Uh, and like I said, it only now has a chapter on sexuality that when you read, you probably won't think is very radical at all, but they're just, they're still, we're behind you significantly on these issues. Um, so I'm glad it's here, um, back in the land of my ancestors. <laughs> you all know how to do it right. So. Brandon, I hope that you'll stay with us and drink tea and eat chocolate cake. Oh my. There is, yeah, Simon's just... He's extraordinary with cakes, so you're well, going for a treat. And, um, um, but I just wanted to say, officially, thank you very much thank indeed. Uh, it's wonderful having you here. We really yeah. do appreciate you taking the time out. And, um, um, and now we'll collie you on an yeah. <laughs> individual basis. And I'll say also, I hate this part. I have books in the back. Um, I'll sell them, sign them for $10. If you want them, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.